Hi guys, good afternoon and welcome to Mutual Fund Corner. I'm Pavitra Parekh. With me is Sonal Bhutra and today we have a very interesting topic to discuss and one that we actually get several queries about. So we're looking at international funds today, the pros, the cons, the potential, what it can really do for your portfolio. And so now this is also a good time, right, to be looking at uh, this kind of topic for two reasons. A, we're seeing the whole China reopen play out after their zero COVID policy. And B, after nearly a year of regulatory limitations, just recently, Indian equity funds investing in overseas markets have once again opened up and they're accepting funds from domestic investors. So all in all, uh, this is a good time for a full-fledged explainer. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's the reason we've got an expert for our viewers yeah. as well, right? We have with us Santosh Joseph, who's the founder and partner at Germinate Investor Services. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today and as Pavitra said it's the right time to discuss international investing as well so let's start with that first because at this time what do you see as the key advantages of international funds and in investing there hi Sonal and Pavitra it's a good time to be talking about these international funds uh, especially now since we have the opportunity to do so now first things first uh, many of us like the entire, uh, you know, uh, feeling of putting our money internationally. But I think when you go down the layer and look why, you realize that the entire India opportunity, the domestic opportunity is about three or three and a half percent of the global opportunity we have to invest in equities. So therefore, the minute you start looking beyond your borders or beyond the domestic market, you've got a vast canvas to consider to invest. That's the first, uh, you know, exposure opportunity. The second opportunity is diversification. You know, you can put your money in more places than just your local market. Now, by doing so, some of the investors who've already done it in the past have benefited by the rupee dollar movement to the point that over the last decade, which is the last 10 years, they made over 3% compounded annual return just by being in these international funds. So it's it's a win-win in many cases because you get a, a larger exposure to the true equity market across the world. You can diversify your portfolio and you also get to benefit from the uh, currency. All right. Uh, so there are definitely lots of benefits and it sounds very attractive when you put it like that, right? Because there's this entire basket of opportunity waiting for you outside your own borders as well. But you know, Santor, something that we need to highlight is that international funds carry all the risks that pertain to investing in the markets. But there are some additional risks as well, right? Um, such as the currency risk, political economic risk, all of that. Uh, what do you see as the main cons of investing in international markets? Or at least, you know, something that you should be aware of as an additional risk? I think uh, rightly pointed out. See, when you first look at the currency, it's important to understand the difference between the returns of the asset and the return that the asset gives you, net of the currency impact. There have been times where the currency has given you a good return, uh, The sorry, the asset has given you a very good return, but the currency is diminished, muted, or actually even made the return go negative. So please bear in mind that the currency also forms uh, a total return impact on the investment that you make internationally. The second part is the geopolitical risks. Now, while many of us are very well attuned to the local uh, political developments, uh, we may not be so well aware of what's happening in some of the developed markets or some of the other markets where we are keen to invest. Now, there's also little that we can do to control them. Now, I remember very vividly uh, when Trump came into power, it was one of the big upsets all over the world. And when Trump didn't get into power, there was another big upset. And when Biden came, now these are uh, political uh, developments that happen, which nothing that you or I can do about. Uh, but we got to be aware of these things. And the third thing is the the economic condition of the economy that our investments are going to be in. Now, whether it's inflation, whether it's recession, or whether interest rates, or any other particular activity, could be uh, food inflation, could be supply side problem. As investors domestically investing in international funds, there's very little that we can do, but be aware and also ensure your portfolio is so positioned that these have little impact on your portfolio because you can't mitigate this risk but you have to ensure that these risks are number one well aware and number two well managed okay can't mitigate those risks but find out ways to navigate so a follow-up on that itself santosh because most international mutual funds they invest either through a fund of fund structure or through a feeder fund and you know sometimes there may not be adequate information available for indian investors on the underlying funds is that also a concern for you actually it's not a concern while I agree to the point that there's a little bit of a lag or a little bit of delay because sometimes, uh, you know, just you look at the day-to-day -day operations, 
in India, you get this uh, same price of the day that you're buying some uh, security or if you're buying a mutual fund, you get the same day now if the funds are provided for. Whereas in an international fund, there's a day or two lag even for you to get allotted the units. And when it comes to information about the portfolio or the changes in the underlying portfolio, sometimes it, you have to wait for the month end and sometimes you have to also look at the, uh, the conditions that you have about the portfolio disclosures that the underlying fund have for us to know if there's a material change in the portfolio. Having said that, you shouldn't really worry too much about it because I think what's important is if you've taken a call based on understanding the asset and the exposure that you need, then you're fine. Of course, there's a little bit of a lag, but it's not that you're in a black hole, there's no information. There is plenty of information available. All right, that point is absolutely well taken. There is still information available. Uh, Santosh, you know, slightly broader question on this, because like we were mentioning that there are some additional risks here. Do you think this is a space that's um, best explored perhaps only by slightly advanced investors? And uh, by advanced, I just mean maybe someone who's a little bit experienced, has been around for a while, and not someone who's uh, getting into investing for the first time? Absolutely true. And though international funds are so easily available today to invest, and I think uh, the platforms and the mutual fund companies have made it so accessible, it's not for everyone. Now, when we mean advanced, we mean experienced, we mean informed, we mean people who know the whereabouts of these funds. Now, in another category, it could also mean investors have access to people who can help them with these decisions. It could be their advisor, it could be their distributor, it could be their bank or whoever this is, who's got the bandwidth and the wherewithal to understand these risks, to assimilate whether the client needs these funds, then even a new investor can invest. But the general thumb rule we say is that an advanced, informed or experienced investor would make better choices as far as these funds are concerned. Okay, so you know one of the reasons why these are in vogue as well is, as Pertra mentioned earlier, overseas mutual funds, they are now open for investments again. So in that case, what should your strategy look like at this point in time? Well, it's a good uh, uh, thought that, you know, we got these funds open back again, but just that they're open doesn't mean that we should go and put our money there. Uh, I think you should fit it well into your portfolio. Now, if the portfolio uh, construct that you already have for yourself, basically on the risk reward or the diversification or the need for the exposure rises, only then please consider in, in, in these international funds. Otherwise, I would not just uh, randomly, uh, you know, cons cons consider international funds just because the limits are open or now you can invest freely. Now, this is one uh, mistake that investors tend to do is that invest because it's available without realizing why I need it into my portfolio. I think if you answer the second question, why uh, it makes sense, I think then it becomes a lot easier to choose. Hmm. All right. This is the same thing that happens when um, an investor doesn't really understand which fund to buy as well, right? So they just buy a little of everything and hope that something will hit it. But, yes. um, you they know... Just generally spray around and then you realize it doesn't make any impact. Yeah, exactly. So then that actually brings me to my next uh, question. How, if you are investing in international funds, and I know this is different for everyone because you can't have a one-size-fits-all approach, but how much do you suggest you keep in international funds? There has to be, uh, you know, some amount for it to be meaningful, right? Uh, see, you have to understand that these international funds do not come under the LRS route, mm. which means for domestic investors who are not worried about that LRS route but want a lot of exposure can take. Having said that, it's not for everyone. Now, for investors uh, watching this show and if you like to take international exposure and you know you're going to be measured, is there a standard thumb rule? Maybe you, we will be safe to say that if you consider 5 to 10% of your overall portfolio uh, to be allocated to international equity, you would be safe. Now, again, this number is a general thumb rule, is for people who do not have access to advice or expertise to make that decision. Uh, but for there are other category of investors who are well-informed, well-aware. Uh, these international funds are a great way to get foreign exposure and not breach the LRS limit and therefore, uh, you know, get the desired exposure and still uh, have that as a meaningful part of the portfolio. Okay. So, uh, it depends, of course, as you said, uh, on various factors, the amount. But uh, is there a minimum time horizon an investor should have when they actually invest in international funds? Yes. Again, international funds are not those quick, uh, fast return schemes just because you invest in a fancy uh, team, stock, or even an international uh, uh, fund. Now, like equities, you need to understand that the risk, uh, risk uh, exposure that you are getting yourself into. So, therefore, uh, come with a three to five year investment horizon on a minimum, because that's exactly what normally one looks at even investing in equities domestically. 
Now, in international, those risks still persist, but also you have those extra stuff that we just spoke about. So I think if you do not have a three to five year horizon or more, then it's better that you stay away. Uh, it's better that you consider this as a strong part of your portfolio for long term. All right, got that. Uh, Santosh, this has been very helpful, but uh, we have to take a very quick break. Right now, we're going to be back in just a minute and then we're going to discuss how you really pick which fund you should go for in that huge basket of international funds, which is really available to us. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back uh, and we still have with us Santosh Joseph from Germinate Investor Services and we are talking all about international funds and investments there as well. Uh, you know Santosh, we spoke about what are the cons, what are the possible risks that one should be aware of. Uh, but as we have spoken about the fact that there are several types of international funds, there will be country specific, region specific, theme based. How do you know what to pick from that big basket? Well, you're right. We're actually a bit spoiled for choice. We've got plenty of opportunities over there. Now, actually, it's a lot easier than your question that is that, first of all, is there a specific geography that you want or are you going to go for a broad-based thing? Now, normally, if you're investing for the first time, it's better that you take a more broad-based approach than just a single geography or a single asset ex exposure. Now, within that, you also have exposure on the active side or the passive side. Now, you know, internationally, uh, passives are a big theme and a big subject, which is the ETFs. So in India, we do have many uh, international funds in the fund of fund route where the underlying is a uh, extremely successful or a extremely good benchmark oriented, uh, you know, passive fund. So from an investor perspective, I think a little bit of clarity of thought on what I'd like to include in my portfolio, whether it's a broad based theme or a narrow sectoral theme, whether it's an active strategy or a passive strategy, whether it's country specific or even a theme specific. For example, uh, we've just loved the whole tech side of the story uh, coming in from the developed world, especially from the Americas. And many of our investors have taken a call because, you know, that tech exposure you can't get in any other market or maybe even domestically. So therefore, we made uh, those inroads. So I think um, international funds do offer a uh, do offer us Indian investors plenty of choice, and I think our choice can be narrowed down specific to what we want, both in terms of creating a, a negatively correlated uh, portfolio internationally with the options that are available there. Okay, that is very helpful on how to really go about picking which you know fund would be right for you within what is available internationally. Uh, Santosh, you know, another reason I wanted to have this chat with you and plan a full show is because right now we're seeing that entire China reopening play out, right? Um, the markets have corrected so much in China, Hong Kong. We've seen the Nasdaq correct over 20%. Do you think this is a good time to be looking at those markets? I mean, these valuations are hugely attractive. Yeah, so that brings to another important point that one cannot go blindly into these international markets. Yeah. Uh, you know, for most of us who are investors in 2021, if you ask them today, their experience of international investing is not great. In fact, they've taken a big drawdown. Whereas when you look at those same markets today and those same themes and opportunities, you're getting them at very good valuations in relation to what it was about a year ago. Now, whether it's uh, the whole uh, China and Hong Kong reopen story or after the, the nice uh, big tech meltdown that we've seen happen in the US big tech companies, valuations today are a lot more comfortable than what it was about a year ago. So therefore, for an investor, uh, if you were considering to invest, for some reason you could not, or if you do already have an investment, today is a great opportunity to either, you know, shore up a little more, or if you're a new investor, this is a great time for you to get the best at a good valuation. Okay, so when we are talking about returns, valuations, uh, what really matters to an investor at the end of the day is what are the post-tax returns? What is the, What are they finally getting in their hands, right? So in this scenario, can you tell us how are the international funds taxed? Yeah, so whether the international funds are in an equity uh, diversified fund, actively or passively managed, all these come under one uh, umbrella, that is, they're treated as non-equity assets. Now, many people get confused saying that, hey, I'm investing in an international equity fund. Shouldn't I be taxed as uh, equity taxation? The answer is no, it is non-equity taxes. Therefore, long term for qualification, it is 36 months and anything less than 36 months is short term. Now, in the short term, the taxation is as per your slab, whatever the slab rate that an individual falls into. 
Whereas in the long term, you have a 20% tax rate, which is long-term capital gains for non-equity. And also you have the benefit of indexations that you can take by the virtue of being a long-term investor after being in the fund uh, for a 36-month period. All right. So that is on the taxation of international funds as well. With that, I think we've covered pretty much everything there is that we wanted to talk about with respect to, you know, the benefits, the risks. How do you really go about creating a strategy and then uh, taxing it? So, Santosh, thank you very much for joining us and taking out the time for this show and helping us really understand how to go about investing in international funds. Thank you for joining us. With that, uh, from Sonal and me, we are going to wind down on this edition of Mutual Fund Corner. Thank you guys for tuning in. And we have closing bell up next for the last hour of trade.